July the 12th, 2022. Guys, over the last uh, few months, we've seen a lot of information coming out about shutdowns in transportation. Union Pacific, which is owned by BlackRock and a couple of other people, Vanguard, I think, are the two major stockholders, shut down the transportation of, first we saw grains and fertilizer, then diesel and uh, DEF for the trucks. And trains also run on diesel. Boats run on diesel. Big ships run on diesel. Fishing vessels, all of the above. Farm tractors, of course. Now, what we're looking at uh, is a deadline looming this coming Monday between the reunions and the railroad uh, about wages and benefits and things like that. And they they could not come to a compromise three weeks ago, so they were given, it's automatic, I think, in these trade negotiations, a 30-day cooling off period, which ends Monday. Now, what they're hoping for, if they cannot come to an agreement, is that they'll have the president, um, kind of hard word to say, step in and in, uh, intervene in this. Now, under normal conditions, under normal presidency, maybe that would happen. Come in, set up something to help benefit both sides or bring them both to the table into an agreement. But right now, we're not under normal conditions, guys. We've seen no uh, attempt at improving transportation, improving oil production, fertilizer, grain, the whole nine yards. We have seen no improvement. We've only seen the exact opposite. So this could be part of the plan. But it's saying if this actually happens, if they don't come to agreement by Monday, the his historic supply chain crisis that we are experiencing right now would rapidly become far worse. So, guys, we you are less than a week out from this happening. Now, if that shuts down, you got to look at a three-day lapse between other things like w with when the sh train ship to the outlets, the trucks pick it up there a lot of times, and then they every three days they supply the grocery stores. So you need to keep that in mind. You've got about a week to either go somewhere, secure this, or get it in the order chain, food, water, supplies, if you don't already have them. It says the each train each year trains in the U.S. transport approximately 1.7 billion tons of raw materials and finished goods to their ultimate destination. If that suddenly stops happening, our economy goes into the toilet. It says they bet we better hope that the national rail carriers and the unions representing the workers can come to an agreement before next Monday. Railroad freight across the U.S. could come to a screeching halt. July the 18th, if progress isn't made on the labor contract between the national rail carriers and their unions. Guys, Atlas is shrugging daily. Union officials stress they do not want to go on a strike, but argue they're being forced to consider the option in a bid to get better benefits, wages, and staffing. We aren't just talking about a partial paralysis of rail traffic. This would be a nationwide strike, and the entire system would suddenly be frozen. Guys, do you understand how close we are to food and fuel rights? At the moment, the two sides are in a cooling-off period, but that cooling-off period will be over at 12.01 a.m. on July the 18th. The two sides were forced into this 38-day cooling-off period after failing to reach an agreement working through the National Mediation Board. The cooling off period prevents unions from striking or railroads from locking out their workers while they continue to negotiate. That cooling off period ends at midnight on July 18th, and a coalition of unions should choose to go, uh, could choose to go on strike at that point," said Sheet Metal Air Rail Transportation U Union President Jeremy Ferguson. At this point, it appears there will be a strike unless Joe Biden uses his powers to intervene. And that is precisely what the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is asking him to do. Now, that brings back my first question. 
If they're stopping all the other things we need and shipping it overseas, why would they step in to stop this catastrophe? If this goes down, guys, this is going to be the beginning of major chaos. It says the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is calling on the president to help resolve a dispute between the country's Class 1 railroads and 12 rail unions to avert a possible rail strike beginning July 18th. Remember, East Coast to West Coast, nationwide. In a letter sent to the White House on Wednesday, U.S. Chamber President Suzanne Clark warned that the decision last month by the National Mediation Board to release the railroads and unions from mediation and begin a 30-day cooling off period presents a new challenge to the U.S. business community. Sure it is, every business will suffer and most likely shut down without shipment. It says, that, again, either party is free to exercise self-help options unless the administration acts, including a strike beginning at 12.00 a.m. on the 18th with the 30-day cooling-off period ends. Now, in the article, they're saying that one way or the other, this labor dispute will eventually be resolved. Let us hope it will be sooner than later. Guys, but that, <clears throat> this is part of what I call hopium. A couple years ago, we, this would have never occurred. Something would have done before this because the past administration understood the economy depends on transportation. Food depends on it. But now it's not that they don't understand or that even though some people appear to be out of it, the main voice of whoever is speaking behind the curtains is not stupid. It's called evil. And so I, I, when I see that, I cringe in news reports. Oh, it's so stupid they're doing this. Or how can they not have the mental capability to realize the destruction they're causing? It's not that. When you see that, guys, realize that whoever's telling you that bull is either paid to do that, to keep it from looking like evil, or they're just naive themselves. Now, we're also looking at drought, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, and I've had questions about that, uh, and it were technical questions. Some people were asking, well, what, what about, how can we look at the input of Lake Powell and Lake Mead compared to their output? In other words, are they outputting more water through the dams and through their hydroelectric systems than they're intaking from much upstream? Uh, so you've got Lake Powell is up on the Arizona, um, what is that, Utah border? And then you go down to the Arizona and Nevada border for Lake Mead. But on the river, guys, and if you want to, if you were in that area, I'd, I'd pay very close att attention to this. But I'm going to give you some of the math, and I'm going to give you some links. And what I want you to do is, if you're interested, I can give you the data and the link to the input and output of both Lake Powell and Lake Mead through the government links or through the watershed links or whatever they are there. I have those now and I've been looking at them for a few days. I've seen them before and what you've got to do in the math is a couple of things. First of all, and the reason I'm saying this if you were looking at Lake Mead water levels, and let's go there for a moment and look at that, but if you're looking at Lake Mead water levels, it's going to depend on what they release from Powell. And that you've got 360 miles of river between the two dams, between letting it out of Lake Powell and uh, it reaching Lake Mead. Now, get if you're interested, you can screenshot these graphs, save them, go back and do your study, back up the video, whatever. But there are a couple things you would need to know. First, how long does it take water to travel the 360 miles from Powell to Mead? And that's going to depend on the release, the speed of the water. If it's a flood, it's going to travel faster than the average outlet. But this chart is, goes back a couple of years, but it still applies. And the way they did it, they put red dye, harmless red dye, into the river, and then they measured the amounts downstream when they got to that part. And that would give you the speed of the river. Now, a few years ago, we were seeing releases, looking at the chart, 
of around 45,000 cubic feet uh, per, uh, of dam releases per second. Now, we're down now below 15,000 feet. See this line? We're dealing with 12, 10, 9, sometimes 13, 14, but 15 is kind of high. Now look at the chart. One is on the left, two, three, four, five, and that is miles per hour. So if you've got a release of around 15 cubic feet per second at Powell, it's going to be probably traveling around 2.2 miles per hour. But now we're below that, so we can average this between one and a half and two miles an hour. We'll just say two because when I show you the chart, you'll see that we're well below 15,000 feet on our releases, or cubic feet per second, right? So you got 360 miles. So if you got two miles an hour, which you got 180 hours and that it would take to go at the release speeds we're dealing with now, at least 180. If it's down around 8,000, 9,000, it may get down to 1.5 miles an hour. But you figure at seven to eight days, and the water released from Powell will reach Lake Mead. Okay, you see what I'm saying? If it was 45,000, the water would be tra tra traveling at four miles an hour. Up above that, you may get a five mile an hour stream, but we're going to have to deal with what we're seeing. And so two would be an average. You may take a little more than that, depending on the release. Now, this is the current level at Mead. This was uh, today at 9 a.m. this morning. Pool is a full pool. It's 187 feet below full pool. 1,041. The last video we did, we were 1,043 feet. That's a water level. You can see the graph here, 2022 compared to the green graph in 2021 and the pink graph in 2020. But that's what we're staying, looking at currently. Now let's look at the links to where you can get the data. Now this link and the link to Lake Powell I will put in the below the description and in the comments. But this is for Lake Mead Water Database. And of course, if my huskies are wanting to cut up in here. But anyway, and again, I'll put a link to it. And it tells you that the last reading was yesterday here on the 22nd. Scroll down. Lake Mead is 26.17 feet from one year ago. Now, scroll down. And it's going to give you the last 14 measurements of the last four days. Now, this is where it gets... Uh, interesting uh, and can be a headache. But to starting here at the bottom, June 28th, going up to yesterday, July 11th, you've got 14-day period. Here, you've got uh, the percentage of change, and this can be slightly misleading because of a couple of things. But your inflow infl rate in cubic feet per second, that's what we were looking at, uh, yesterday, on the 11th, was 13,805 inflow but they let out 14,900, so you've got a declining rate here, right? And that's kind of what we're seeing here. Go back to June 28th. The intake from above from the Colorado coming out of Lake Powell was 9,854 cubic feet per second, but they were letting out 13.1. And don't forget the third straw that's going to drain the last drop out into Vegas. But now if you notice, there's a couple of things you can see here. There's one day the inflow on here, I think it's one day, let me check, one day here, the inflow was, that was on the 4th of July, 1377, when they, the uh, outflow was 1120, so you had about 2,500 more cubic feet per second coming in than you had going out, that's great. So if you look back at Lake Powell, uh, about eight days before this, somewhere in uh, late June, you would probably see a release that was stronger than normal because here's your inflows 13 here and the outflow was 1490 but you start seeing that decline 990 51 on the inflow on july 7th uh, and down here 9568 9854 so what you could do if you got the if you if you want to do this is use this inflow outflow rate it has other information but you can see when powell releases and what it goes down to give it your 360 mile down river uh, flow rates and um, you can see when 
Lake Mead should start to be getting more water, and will the government release more at that time? Or Because they're in a 60-day moratorium, the entire Colorado River system, to balance this thing out, you're going to see these numbers shift. But is it? But it's really a false positive because you're taking from one to give to the other, and it's going out so fast that it's kind of a, it's just a losing game. But if you go down a little bit, it'll give you the last 10, July the 12th, data records, the last 10 years, starting back on July the 12th, 2012, coming up to today. Now, notice then your outflow rates, 14,700, 17,660. So what I'm saying is that's when you're getting that 2.2 miles per hour downriver timing. But when you go here to July the 2024, 20, your outflow was 1884. Now, then that your speed drops tremendously. Remember, at 15,000, we were at the 2.2 miles an hour to make it from Powell to Mead. So this is going to slow it down. And again, this is kind of a headache figuring this stuff out, right? But people have been asking me, what about the input-output data of both of these lakes? And this is it. And again, it gives you the ten year, last 10 years on July 10th. It gives you your average, your your elevation, a lot of information. But if you want to go into this and look at it, you can. Now, the next link will be the same thing. And, guys, look right here. Lakemead.water-data.com. Save that link. Now, it's basically the same. You just uh, come out of lakemead.water dash data.com to lake powell dot water dash dot uh, uh, data dot com and you've got the same information your highest points your lowest points things like that different news things uh, lake powell is down 18.7 uh, feet from one year ago and you come down you got your same last 14 day measurements starting june 28 same dates and you can see with the outflow rates that are going to go the 360 miles down river your nothing is really close to the 15,000 cubic inches or cubic feet per second, excuse me. So you, it's, it would be safe to go 1.75 miles an hour to two right in there. If you're going to estimate, it's not really going to make that much difference. And if it's a day or two different uh, in the timing, but you will see definitely what's going on. Now, you've got an inflow rate from here that comes from up north of that area. And notice that Powell on July the 11th, yesterday, only had an inflow of 660 or 6,602 cubic feet per second. And its outflow was 11,961. Not quite double, but not very far from that. And they're trying to balance water down, little, uh, down river to Mead. And that's going to affect Powell. And you, go, you can go through a lot of the days except here on july 9th the inflow was a little higher than the outflow but most of the days the outflow is higher look at this um, here you've got a little bit better inflow again this would be july 3rd but this is the data guys here's your 12 years on your average and again going back to july 12 2012 we were close to this 14,000 15,000 cubic feet per second outflow but that's changing uh, very quickly, and your inflow rates are changing. You see Monday, July the 4th, look at, I mean, July the 12th, today, look at the inflow of Powell, 3525 cubic feet per second, while it let out four times that much at 12744. You're going to start seeing Powell suffer to make Lake Mead balance, but they're this is a downhill slide. There's nothing that's going to happen in the near future unless you had a, an Arctic ice age that dumped tons of mount, uh, snow in the mountains that's going to stop this. So we're going to see massive outflow and uh, people leaving seven states that's involved, 40 million people, seven states involved. The heaviest, I think, is Vegas, Southern California, Ayers, and Phoenix, but there's seven states. And that those people got to go somewhere. You, you can have the finest home. You can have everything you need. But you don't have water. You're not going to make it but a few days. 
You're not going to flush toilets. You're not going to have anything to drink. No showers. No washing clothes. Land is going to be worthless. Is that part of the plan? We don't know. But uh, this is the data and the information for you guys in that area that are really want to keep up with how this thing is flowing. That's what it is. Again, I did a lot more inf a lot more um, study into this just to get the the speeds of the water and things like that, and uh, looking at it and trying to put it in kind of a more compact um, video that made sense, if it made any sense at all. But here is that information again. Both links will be below. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I see one of my huskies wants something. But, um, <laughs> it, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, he tickles me. Uh, Tina's making some doggy peanut butter snacks, and he smells them, and he's ready for one. They're not quite ready, but they let you know you, if you guys know how these puppies are. Anyway, um, watch for more sure along the... <laughs> He wants a peanut butter thing now. <laughs> That's Booger, the blunt, the uh, blonde with the double blue eyes. And uh, <laughs> he's quite vocal. But watch the system in the Gulf. It's going to bring rain from the Florida Panhandle over to Torch Houston in the next few days. I'll do an update on that uh, later tonight or in the morning. But we're watching it, guys. Things are getting very drastic. The beginning of the video is as important as the end uh, because a nationwide train strike would be the perfect blow to this nation and that's what we've seen time and time again we're watching it you watch it it's a heads up be safe